Goede avond, dames en heren. Welkom bij deze Bolero webinar die volledig in het teken staat van Euvenma deze avond. Mijn naam is Olivier van der Wouden en ik ben de analist bij KBC Securities die het aandeel uh, Euronaf opvolgt. Ik ben blij om vanavond het management van Euronaf te mogen verwelkomen. We hebben bij ons uh, Hugo de Stoop, CEO van Euronaf, Lieve Logge, CFO en Brian Gallagher, Head of Investor Relations. Ik ga zo meteen aan hen het uh, woord doorgeven uh, voor een korte introductie van Euronaf. Gevolgd door wat extra achtergrond bij de recent gepubliceerde derde kwartaalresultaten. Daarna hebben we ook tijd voorzien om enkele vragen voor jullie te beantwoorden. Via de chatfunctie kunnen jullie een vraag stellen die ik dan zal voorleggen aan het management, waarop zij dan antwoord zullen geven. Als laatste wil ik ook nog even vermelden dat de webinar vandaag opgenomen wordt en dat jullie binnen enkele dagen een link zullen ontvangen via welke jullie de webinar kunnen herbekijken. Zo, dit was het laatste uh, van mijn kant. Dus uh, Brian, I will uh, pass over the floor to you. Well, good evening, everybody, and thank you for joining us and giving us your valuable time this evening. Uh, we're here to talk about uh, Euronav, the largest uh, crew tanker platform in the world, uh, domiciled and based in Belgium. Uh, I'm joined tonight with our chief executive, Hugo de Stoop, and also Lieve Logger, our CFO. We'll run through this presentation for about uh, 25 minutes or so, and then we can throw it over to uh, wider questions. But if I go to the first slide, if you can see that, I can see uh, in terms of what the um, agenda is going to be. Uh, we're going to talk about firstly, obviously, most importantly, Euronav. We'll then spend some time talking about the dynamics of our business. We'll then move on to the financials and how we structure our business to cope with, with the difficulties that we occasionally face. We'll then focus on the fundamentals of our marketplace and then look at some of the short-term catalysts and some of the exciting times we believe are coming in our market um, over the medium term. Uh, with that, we'll come to a conclusion and then finalize some uh, closing commentary in terms of how Euronav is dealing with the energy transition, and in particular, the challenges, but also the opportunities that come uh, for a crew tanker business like ourselves with regard to a sustainable future. As I mentioned before, we are the largest uh, publicly listed platform of crew tankers in the world. We have 48 VLCCs. Those are the very large categories you see in the bottom right. There are 2 million barrel vessel capacity um, ships. And we have um, 30 Suez Max in terms of those are 1 million barrel capacity ships. These are some of the biggest ships you can physically get in the world. Um, we have a very, very diversified portfolio amongst those um, craft. Uh, we also own four larger ships that were ever built in the crew tanker space. These are 3 million barrel vessels two of which we converted into a floating storage platform, the FSO you see in the top right. That's on a longer term contract to 2032 in Qatar with a joint venture partner. And then two other ULTCs, ultra large uh, crude carriers of 3 million barrel vessels, uh, which we also own and operate mainly for storage opportunities. The one thing we try and manage as our business is that we have an awful lot of um, elements beyond our control. And so we try and control the one thing we can do, which is our financial structure. You can see this since 2015, we've been gradually building our exposure as the companies continue to grow, uh, but also continue to grow our available liquidity. That isn't cash sitting on our balance sheet, but it's access to cash through um, various banking facilities, uh, physical cash, uh, and also making sure we have sufficient level of uh, liquidity to get through uh, the cycle, depending on where we are within it. In our history, we've been based in Belgium since uh, we were listed and floated and created in, in, the, in the late 80s under the Savris family. We listed in Euronext in 2004. And you can see consistently since then, we've continued to build the platform on a very, very um, uh, consistent basis, but also within very, very disciplined financial framework. We listed in New York in 2015, and that allowed us dual listing where the shares are equally um, traded and equally weighted in between New York Stock Exchange and Euronext in Brussels. We've used that opportunity and that platform to expand for even further when we bought a rival called Generate in December 2017. So that uplifted our fleet to 60. And since then, we've been growing organically in terms of either new builds that we've ordered uh, or more importantly, buying other people's ships at very, very cheap valuations. We've been increasingly focused in recent years with regard to our sustainability effort. We're the only major tanker business that has got a carbon disclosure program a rating of, of B. Um, which is amongst the best that, that, that's out there in terms of the availability. So a very, very strong history, um, which we're very proud of. But we basically have an integrated platform with a very clear, clear focus. We have the best in operational structure in terms of best in class. We have amongst the lowest cash break evens uh, amongst our peer group. We are the largest fleet, but we also have a, a high degree of contracted revenue. 
not only were those contracts I talked about to 2032, we have some of our Suez Max uh, contracted with Valero to 2025, and also um, a couple of our VLCCs on longer term charges as well. We've continued to focus our fleet renewal. Um, we've, in the last 12 months, we've ordered eight new ships at very, very attractive prices, about 15% below where the current market price is for those new ships. Um, and there's going to be an opportunity which we believe will be, uh, we're going to talk about later, that these are going to be ships with the very latest technology. Not only are they going to be eco vessels, which means that they're the most efficient, but they can have the optionality to have the very latest technology uh, adapted to those ships and therefore make them very, very attractive in terms of their emissions uh, compared to conventional ships on the water today. We've done all this expansion and building of the platform in a very, very cohesive, but also within a very conservative financial structure. Uh, we've always had a, a loan to value, uh, i.e. Uh, a gearing ratio of a target of below 50%. We've continued to have that liquidity focus I spoke about on the previous slide. But even within that, we've also been very, very focused on making sure shareholders uh, gain in terms of the benefits that we have from when we have periods of the up cycle. We've returned over $1.2 billion of cash dividends since 2004. Uh, we've given a 17% uh, dividend yield over the last 12 months or so. Uh, given a $2.40 of return in both share buyback and cash dividends in that time. This is a very robust, but also very um, operationally leveraged uh, platform uh, with a very clear focus. And that's reflected in this slide here. We compare ourselves with a major peer group that we have uh, traded in, in mainly in the States. You can see that you basically get more bang for your buck, quite simply, uh, per dollar um, invested in Europe. So you can see the various different rate scenarios that we have uh, on, the, on the slide here. You can see on each of those different rate scenarios on the far left, break even sort of scenario, uh, a reasonable mid market scenario in the middle, and then peak uh, on the far right. You can see how aggressive and how strong the cash generation is uh, between $2 and, and nearly $6. And that would uh, give a, a cash free cash flow yield of between 30% from Euronav, which is more than any of our, of our peers on those same assumptions from earlier this month. So this is a very leveraged sector, uh, but you need to have capital discipline, we believe, in order to be successful within it. And the base value of our business comes from the cumulative, if you like, recycle. What's the steel value of our business? What's the base value of our, our company in terms of the scrap value, in terms of the steel? If you multiply that by uh, our fleet, you get a total value of 1.6 billion, and that gives you about $8 per share. So that gives you a sense of where, if you like, uh, if things were to be, uh, what's the steel value of the company? That's where Euronav sits, and you can see how that sits in relation to our net debt. So you can, you can understand we have very strong conservative financial ratios at the heart of our business. But as I mentioned before, this gives a bit more detail in those shareholder returns, especially since we listed in New York. You can see when we've had good markets in 2015-16, and also in 2019 and 20, we've been very, very keen to make sure that shareholders uh, share in those benefits. Uh, and in particular, we've uh, also been flexible and in 2020, we skewed a lot of those returns towards share buybacks because our shares were trading at a level where we felt was below the intrinsic value. So this won't go away. This is part of our DNA. We've returned nearly half of our market cap back to shareholders in the last five years. But what about the crew tanker business itself? It's not a business that is very high profile and has a number of different dynamics which maybe are not familiar to everybody on this call. The basics of the tanker value chain is that we basically sit in the middle. We deliver oil. That's all we do. It's a very dangerous, but also very volatile business. Um, we've got two million barrels of, of oil sitting on a, on, a, on a, a, a tanker structure, which is about three and a half football pitches long in terms of length. We're delivering to the refinery base. We're also delivering to um, tr oil traders, oil majors, and also national oil companies. So we sit in the middle, having a very key role in terms of the, where we sit in the value chain. And if you want to see a bit more from this, if you go to our website, you can see the link below. Uh, we did a special uh, paper on this a couple of years ago, looking at the dynamics of industry in a bit more detail. We're effectively the middleman within the business. We effectively long haul transport uh, crewed all around the world. These are the major routes that you see in which we would operate in. You can't take a large tanker through the Panama Canal. So that's good news for our business because a lot of the oil which is being developed in particular from the US and what we call the Atlantic. So that includes the North Sea, West Africa, Brazil, uh, the Guinea and Caribbean, etc. That oil has to go long haul, and most of that oil tends to go to Asia. So that's very profitable for our business, uh, and has been a structural trend which has been in place now for the last four or five years, and it's going to continue to accelerate, we believe. But our market is rather commoditized. 
It's very fragmented in terms of the ownership structure. There are a lot of different um, operators of ships, um, but there are very few customers. We only have really three sets of customers, the oil companies and, and national oil companies themselves, such as uh, the state-owned operations that you know, uh, trading companies like Trafigura, Glencore, and then the refinery companies like uh, Valero. So we have a very strong um, base in terms of our, of our customer base, but there's a lot of different owners. There are about 700 um, uh, trading uh, VLCCs in the world fleet. We own uh, um, around about, uh, just under, as I said, just under 50 of those, um, but we're the, the largest owner of um, tankers uh, in the commercial fleet, um, and yet we only have sort of five to six percent market share. So it gives a sense of how fragmented it is. It's also very seasonal. You can see on the top left, uh, we tend to make most of our money in ordinary years um, in Q1 and Q4 as we move into the Northern Hemisphere winter. You can see the cyclicality reflected in rates in the top right on the time charter basis. But the value of our cargo is actually a very small percentage um, of the, uh, the freight cost rather is a very small percentage of the cargo value. And that's important because that means the commodity is in place and has, has allowed the commercial development of the business to develop the way it has. Our ships only are wasting assets though. Um, on average, useful life of a, of a crew tank is going to be around about 20 years. You can see here, very regulated. Every five years you go through a special survey where your ship has to undertake a very, very um, independent examination, uh, which takes about 25 to 30 days by an independent regulator. Then after 15 years of age, that cycle moves from five years to 30 months. And you can see the utilization of ships after 15 and 17 and a half years of age falls quite rapidly and quite markedly. So this is a very regulated part of the industry, uh, which is very, very good, but it means our, our assets really ha only have a useful life of 20 years. And this gives you another sort of indication on the same basis that utilization falls away, but those survey costs rise as you get to uh, the ship that obviously increases in age. And increasingly we're getting more and more onerous and more and more um, costly regulations coming into our business. So for instance, you must fit a ballast water treatment system on your ship uh, after 2019, that's going to cost about $1.5 million. All of these facets uh, mean there's an awful lot of pressure on ships the older they get. And again, coming back to the fragmentation point, you can see that um, one third of the fleet in the VLCC space uh, is owned by players that only own between one and five vessels themselves. So that gives you an indication of how fragmented it is. There's a very long tail of smaller operators in our business, which can sometimes be disruptive to us. Time charter opportunity is something we've looked at and continue to look at as a, as a business as you would expect, but it's a relatively limited opportunity set these days. Uh, time charter is basically where you put your ship on a longer term, one, two, three, four, five year duration contract, usually with an oil major, um, for that long period of time at a set period, sorry, sorry, for a set rate um, in terms of dollars with potential opportunities for profit share on top of that. You can see on the, on the, on the boxes on the top of this chart, you can see in 2019 and in 2021, we've only had about 4% of the world fleet that's actually gone on those longer term charges. We did have an exceptional period in the B period of 2020 when the market was very strong, when we had this big pressure to, to store oil. Uh, but again, it's relatively limited um, opportunity set. And that's how the industry has really changed in the last uh, decade or so, that the oil majors in terms of their importance to tankers has actually reduced quite considerably. And they've been replaced by shorter term visions and, um, and business models of, of mainly people uh, such as Trafigura and Vel um, Glencore in the trading set. And then move on to the financials. And part of the pressure we see on this slide on 21 is that the bank lending to shipping has continued to, to move into decline. Basically, uh, since 2010 to 2020, um, the amount of lending from the global banks to shipping companies generally, and this is all across shipping, not just tankers, this includes container companies, dry bulk companies, ferries, etc and cruise liners has fallen from 450 billion to under 300 billion. So you can see, and the European banks in particular have more than halved their exposure to, uh, to shipping in that time. So financing is continuing to be a real pressure for us in actually gaining access to that capital in what is still a very capital intensive sector. A brand new VLCC today would cost you $100 million plus, and a brand new Suez Max would cost you about $70 million. So the capital intensity hasn't gone from our market, but the bank lending to shipping has definitely changed and a big step change in the last decade. We've tried to mitigate that with longer term relationships with the banks, but also we have a, a trading, uh, trading, two trading bonds now in the Oslo market. And we'll continue to focus on making sure that our, our, our financing is as green as possible. This shows you the strong uh, 
exposure we have and access we currently do have to, to financing. Uh, we have a very, very strong covenant structure on the bottom right. You can see the amount of banks who we engage with and lend with on an ongoing regular basis. And you can see that our repayment schedule um, is relatively benign. We only have to repay, repay a certain amount of cash, a tiny amount of cash over the next three to four years. Um, but we do obviously have some re reductions in our revolving credit exposure. Um, but our financing is very, very competitive. It's amongst the most competitive and best in the industry uh, with margins between 1.5 and 2%. So we're very pleased with the, with the progress that we continue to make in our financing element. And again, this doesn't stand still. A third of our overall funding is now uh, sustainability linked. It has active green elements within it. If we meet or beat those emissions targets that are in, embedded within those uh, sustainable loans, then we get a five basis point uh, improvement in terms of our interest rate. If we don't meet those goals, then we get a five basis point penalty. We anticipate that these, the scale of these penalties and, and uh, incentives are going to increase, and that's what you should continue to expect to see here and have increasing um, uh, the amount of sustainability funding we have uh, going forward. We're very pleased with the progress we've made. We've also got loans from the um, Flemish government with Giga Grant, uh, with a recent uh, European loan, uh, sorry, loan facility, which again is very important to us because obviously uh, we're European um, domiciled. Most of our employees are European. So therefore we pay in euros in what is a dollar denominated business. In terms of the current market, I'm gonna go through the fundamentals, how we see them in the medium term before turning over to talk about some of the short-term catalysts that we see. This is probably the most important slide and why we're very excited about the medium term future for our business in the whole deck. The order book as a, as a ratio to the fleet size on the far left shows that we are basically at 20 to 25 year lows. You can see that only 8% of both VLCC and Suez Max uh, is currently on the order book as a percentage of the fleet. This is really important as it shows that the, the, the supply and pipeline of new ships coming to the, to the marketplace is very much a, over a, a very low level. Yet the age of the fleet in both VLCC and Suez Max terms that's out there at the moment is at over 10 year highs. We haven't seen a, a fleet age profile like this since the market moved from single hull to double hull ships in the early noughties. And again, that's very important because 25% of both the VLCC and Suez Max fleets are already over 15 years of age. And you recall that slide we went through earlier, you'll remember that uh, it's a very important uh, dynamic after 15 years of age, your utilization and where you can place those ships is gonna be very, very difficult going forward. And yet, with the explosion of orders we've seen in, in particular in the container space in the, um, so far in 2021, if you want to go and order a new ship now, you're basically going to have to wait until 2025 at least to take delivery of that ship. It takes two years to build a tanker. They don't tend to make margins at the shipyard when they make these ships. You can see that yard lead time is very long in the context of history. So again, that's another bullish point. We've seen uh, a number of opportunities uh, arise, um, which we took advantage of earlier on this year to, to order new ships, uh, which has allowed us to jump ahead of that queue. And we'll start taking delivery of those new ships uh, in January of next year with two Suez Max. So we're very pleased uh, that we've managed to get 15% of our underlying fleet is gonna be replenished over the next uh, 18 to 24 months with the very latest technology ships. And we're going to talk about that in a bit more detail later. This shows in a bit more detail why it's so important, this Manhattan slide. You can see this is the number of ships in each um, year in terms of the age category. Those green ships are gonna come under increasing pressure, not just from a commercial perspective because of the utilization I spoke about earlier, but because there's new regulations kicking through in 2023 called ECSI, which means that the global regulator, the IMO, along with the banks, will be putting, uh, um, exerting a lot of pressure on ships to make sure that they're performing as best they can. If they're in the, in the, in the highest 20% of emitting ships, and you think about ships, uh, the older your ship, the more likely it's going to be in that 20%, then, um, then you'll have to submit a plan to the IMO, or else you potentially have the license taken away and the ship will have to leave the world fleet. So there's some real regulation coming through with real teeth, which is gonna impose itself on our marketplace, we believe, starting um, in about 18 months time. Tonne miles is a very key driver of our marketplace. As I mentioned earlier, how far the oil has to travel is very important to us. And on average, a million barrels per day of expansion in terms of production, which goes through into production, means that you need about 30 VLCCs because most of the growth in terms of the consumption is still coming from that area from India through to China, and that's where most of the oil is headed. That's either gonna come quite simply from the Middle East, and if you all got supplied by, by the Middle East barrels, then you'd need 20 VLCCs to facilitate that uh, million barrels per day. 
if it all came from the Atlantic, you need 41. So we just assume you basically split the difference and half the oil comes from each of those. So that's where we get that, that number, which has been pretty well tested going back in history, that a million barrels per day of growth re results in a requirement of 30 VLCCs over that 12 month period. So you have a multiplier effect, which comes from the ton miles as a part of our business. Asset prices are already pricing in a lot of recovery, despite a really, really tough background over the last nine to 12 months in terms of freight rates, um, asset prices have continued to rise starting this time last year. And asset prices historically have been a, about an 85% correlation with share prices of tanker stocks compared, compared with freight rates, which have a correlation historically of about 55%. So asset prices are, tend to be the canary in the coal mine in signaling when markets are going to sort of enjoy a better time. The ordering of new ships has completely dried up. You can see we haven't seen ordering of, of a new vessel in um, Suez Max since July and in VLCC since June. And part of that is because of the technology. The green elements of these bars on the left-hand side show you the ships that have got alternative fuel capability, of which all of the eight that we've got in the shipyards uh, currently have. So these ships are either going to be fitted with dual fuel LNG, uh, dual fuel ammonia eventually, or certainly have the optionality to have that technology fitted at a later date. So this is very important that these ships are not going to be directly com uh, comparable or competing with conventionally fueled ships at the moment. And the reason that's uh, important is because this delivery schedule is also going to um, show a very strong fundamental support for our business as well. There are no new ships due for delivering 24 on the Vs, and there's uh, I only think only one in, in 24 in the Suez Max. So we, we've got a, a, a window of opportunity where we're going to have very few ships being delivered to uh, the world fleet, uh, most likely in 24, 25, and into early part of 26, simply because there's not been any new orders, and those ships that are coming through in terms of the light green you see on this slide in front of you are largely going to be fitted with new technology and are going to be different in terms of their emission characteristics. And that's very important for us, for our sector. In terms of the other end of the spectrum, in terms of recycling, recycling has now begun to kick in. It's been an unusual cycle because the last 12 months we've had very, very challenging freight rates. We're largely loss making. We would have expected recycling to have started earlier, but it's good that it has started. It's the highest level we've seen in three and a half years. And you can see here in 2017, 2018, the last time we had a sustained period of low rates, it then responded in a basically a resetting of a rebooting of the, of the global fleet size. We're starting to see the early signs of that. And then that should lead, as we saw in 2019 and 20, very strong markets. Doesn't necessarily mean we're going to lead in, move straight into strong markets immediately, but this resetting, rebooting of the world fleet is something which we believe is, is happening. And as we're going to show later, if Iran were to come back into the world economic fold, then that could be another accelerant to that particular trend. I won't spend too much on this. This just shows you where we've been slightly um, puzzled why we haven't seen as much recycling as we would have expected. The far right shows you the blue line, the um, steel price and recycling price has been at all time highs um, since uh, 2008 in terms of the VLCC prices, yet that hasn't triggered the same level of uh, recycling that we've previously seen. And ordinarily we've seen when rates have been where they have been for the last 12 months, that should have seen 5% of the world fleet recycled. We've probably had somewhere between two and a half and 3% of the flight fleet recycled in the, in the last 12 months. Most of that's been in recent months. So we are beginning to see that trend accelerate. And we do believe there's strong grounds given the age profile of the world fleet to see that continue to, to, to uh, expand. Another key driver is that we obviously had a huge shock into 2020 with a huge buildup in global inventory as we all went into COVID into lockdowns. All the oil was still being produced. We didn't have a home to go on. The short term home was to go onto oil tankers. We had a very big bonanza in Q2 last year. We had very high rates as a result because there was a complete swamping of demand over supply of vessels. But that also this reflected in, in a very big build of inventory. That inventory has been basically um, now for over 12 months been sort of taken down and down and down. It's way below the five year averages now. And we should expect to see, and most agencies are now forecasting, we'll start to see inventory build uh, starting in Q1 next year. Inventory build, when inventories are being uh, boosted, means that more oil is being moved around the world to boost those inventories. That's a really good uh, tailwind for our business. And you can see when that happened in 2014, 15, and also 18, 19, that we had very strong markets over the, the preceding um, six quarters. Just a final commentary in terms of the industry structure. It is very fragmented. The left hand side shows you the quoted companies like Euronav in terms of the VLCCs that they currently own. And you can see it totals about 110 uh, out of 840 VLCCs in total on the water. 
and yet if we take the chips that are owned by just the, the players that only have between one and three and you can see that, that that's a bigger proportion of the world fleet and then just taking some uh, mathematical consideration to see how fragmented our industry is you can see a monopoly industry where you when you have one player would get 10,000 points on the HHI index score um, the VLCC sector is close to zero which is perfect competition so it is a very fragmented industry uh, and sometimes um, that can be disruptive to our pricing uh, as we've seen in the last 12 months or so but we are very very constructive both in the medium term but also in the short term the last eight to ten weeks we've seen a number of catalysts coming through this is from our uh, q3 presentation recently not only recycling we're seeing some fuel switching because of the relative price of oil whilst oil price has been moving up it's still relatively attractive compared to other fuels such as natural gas and the lng we're also seeing um, continued post-covid demand recovery Clearly in Europe, that's going to be stalled short term, but in other parts of the world, like the States and the Far East, they're continuing to open up. And again, that global crude inventory, crude inventory even, is now beginning to sort of show some signs of turning to growth rather than being drawn down. But this is probably the most um, sort of simplified structure we can see. We've got demand recovery in the blue line forecast by the IEA, a major um, industrial agency looking at oil forecasting. And then the green line is showing you the OPEC plus production. And it's very unusual for our industry that we've got such a profile and such visibility that we've got basically 400,000 barrels per day um, pledged to be increased in terms of oil on the water uh, via production increases from OPEC plus between now and September. So that's a long visibility of, of four to five million barrels per day of growth coming back. And as we put that into, into the context of the ton mile uh, multiplier effect we spoke about earlier, you can see that this should continue to have really strong um, tailwinds for our business uh, over the next three quarters. Um, short term, we're still seeing a little bit of oversupply of tonnage. The blue line shows you the um, supply of ships compared to the number of available cargoes in the Arabian Gulf over the next 30 days. And you can see this ratio is trading at very high levels. These all time level highs at 1.3 here for most of the last year or so. Whilst it's been a bit volatile short term, it has come down to a lower level. So it is showing some signs of life and the green line is the inverted one-year time charter rate. So that time charter rate has come off the lows of $18,000 a day for a one-year time charter into the low 20s now. So if this correlation continues, and this goes back on any basis that you look at, it's a very strong correlation between these two variables, we should start to see if we get um, that ratio and that oversupply of tonnage down to a level where it is in the medium term, in the mid to low 1.2s, that should correlate with freight rates uh, accelerating into that sort of uh, level that you see on the slide. I mentioned about the switch from fuel oil. This on the left-hand side shows you the natural gas, um, low sulfur fuel, uh, US gasoline, and also LNG in green. Uh, their price is on the same exact basis as if it was a per barrel of oil. And you can see here that the black line is the per barrel of oil price. You can see how, it, how it's actually been completely taken away, in particular against, say, things like LNG and natural gas uh, on a light-for-light on a -light basis. So what we're seeing is people, in particular in Japan, Asia and Europe are switching away from residual fuel oil and other elements uh, of their fueling and switching into crude. Crude is easily available, it's easy to store, and it's easy to buy, and it's clearly very cheap to transport in the short term. And that is basically an opportunity we're seeing. We think it's going to probably boost our winter market uh, by somewhere between half a million and three quarters of a million barrels per day. Iran is something we mentioned earlier. It's very much a wild card in our marketplace. But unfortunately, there's been what we term an illicit trade going through, uh, occupying between 5 and 8% of the large tanker space over the last uh, 12 to 24 months. Basically, well, one of the reasons we, we believe we haven't seen much recycling is a lot of this older tonnage, ships aged 18, 19, 20, 21, 22 years of age, have been bought by private players who've then been able to go and take mainly largely very highly discounted and very cheap Iranian oil, often 20 to 30 dollars per barrel cheaper than the market price and then they've been um, exporting it illegally uh, largely to china um, and the chinese buyers have been very keen to, to buy that and pay um, very lucrative rates in order to, to, to compensate for the risk um, now these ships were checked were taken up at very very low levels in terms of the asset price that they were bought for uh, and clearly they've been able to, to um, undertake a very risky trade often these ships are not insured uh, often these ships are taking very circuit, circuitous routes and switching their signals on and off in terms of their, their uh, AIS signals. Um, but this is very much uh, something which is, as, as, 
has developed um, underneath the, the market's sort of uh, microscope and radar screen over the last uh, 18 months in particular. And to put it into context, you can see here on the left, that these are the number of ships that have been uh, engaged in this sort of trade in the, in the green and the blue, the number of mainly VLCCs. You can see how much a percentage it is making up of the world fleet. You can see how they are very much the older ships. These ships have basically been bought for 15, 17 million dollars. They've done a couple of lucrative trades which have earned that 15 to 17 million dollars back, uh, often uh, in just two voyages. And it's basically taking about a million to a million and a half barrels per day over the last uh, year, 18 months, out of the commercial players' hands. So again, this has been another headwind that we've had to face, and why it's so important as a wild card, if the Iranian um, regime were to come back into the world economic fold, they're having talks uh, next week with regard to the European Union with regard to a potential deal. Uh, that's why it could be very important for us. The Iranians do have their own ships, um, but they're currently used for storage. But this would mean another million barrels per day, roughly speaking, of oil coming back into the world fleet available to commercial tonnage. Today, it's not available to commercial tonnage. So it's a very important short-term boost that we could see operationally, but also structurally, because the left-hand side, we should expect to see these ships on the left-hand side disappear from the world fleet and go to the recycling yards, especially if as those um, operators will be able to get $25, 26000000 million as a scrap price for their, um, their VLCCs now. And in terms of the production we spoke about earlier, uh, we go back in 2018 and 19 when we had about four to five million barrels per day of an increase of uh, production growth over a relatively short period of time, uh, over four or five quarters. Um, you can see that that's reflected um, in better rates um, after sort of three quarters uh, and going to very sustainable higher levels. We're following a similar trajectory a bit from a lower base at the moment, uh, but the key difference here is we could see from start to finish seven and a half million barrels per day of production growth coming back into the world fleet uh, in terms of uh, being available for the world tanker fleet. And if that were to be the case, that would be done over six quarters. That could be very, very, um, very key driver for our business because effectively we don't, trans we don't transport demand, we transport available cargoes and available barrels on the water. So in conclusion, um, if you get the chance to look at our website or get the chance to listen to our quarterly calls, since 2015, we've, we've sort of summarized our outlook in terms of the five main drivers of our business with the traffic light system. This is how we think the next three to six months is going to go for each of these different uh, uh, segments. Uh, we upgraded both the demand for oil and the supply of oil based on, firstly, um, the fact that we're seeing further COVID recovery, um, but also on the supply side because of those OPEC plus and the visibility of those OPEC plus production tapers really beginning to kick in now, in particular since July and August. Ton miles has remained an amber light. Um, again, we think that's going to be more of a key feature for 20, 2022, especially if the Far East continues to uh, reopen and expand. Vessel supply is looking very constructive. Um, whilst we've got some ships coming on stream in 2022, you can see the picture of 22, 23, 24, 25 is very, very benign in terms of new supply. And if we continue to see some of that older tonnage leave the way it should do on a logical, um, mathematical, theoretical basis, and then we should have a, a decent bit of vessel supply background. And of course, our balance sheet, we believe, remains pretty well set. Our leverage remains below 50%. We have ample liquidity to deal with the cycle, even if it were to continue to be challenging. And of course, we've still got that very strong shareholder focus. And we've been also added, been able to add 15% growth to our underlying fleet, uh, finance that through existing resources. I'm just going to finish off with a couple of slides. We are an oil tanker business. We know what we do. We're very much aware that we're in an industry that is under a lot of pressure as part of the energy transition and also a lot of focus in terms of oil's future role within the energy transition. But we've done a lot of work and we're very proud to be uh, a part of that industry. Shipping has got a, ma a major opportunity. It's very, very well placed in terms of its emission profile compared to other um, major transportation methods. That gives us a huge opportunity as we're looking to generate that uh, with our own um, fleet expansion program. Sustainability at Euronav has been very busy over the last 18 months. We've hired a dedicated sustainability manager, who's making great strides. Um, later on um, this year and into early next year, we're going to have a dedicated day outlining our targets and what we're looking to do on emissions. So investors can actually hold us to account on what we're doing in terms of what we're saying and how we deliver on that. As I mentioned before, a third of our funding is already ESG linked. That number is only going to rise with the work that Lever and our team have already done or will continue to do. It's reflected in our award structures, not only in terms of the 
the climate work we've got in, in CDP, which is a, a global um, standard um, for that sort of disclosure. But also we were recently voted uh, by a broker, uh, the second best uh, shipping company in terms of our ESG credentials. Uh, Hugo was at COP26 a couple of weeks ago and is playing a lead, lead role in terms of the Getting to Zero um, coalition and also in the um, various shipping associations that we're part of. So shipping's got a great platform to, to build on. and We very much want to be part of that. And reflected in that is the opportunity set that could come from our investment in technology. Energy dual fuel ships have the opportunity to reduce your CO2 emissions by between 2 and 25 percent. It's a transition opportunity. We're going to future proof our ships. Ammonia ships are not ready uh, to go on the water just yet, certainly not for uh, ships of our size. But we believe that there's the opportunity that that could be feasible in 25, 26 uh, or soon after that. We're future proofing those vessels, those eight we've got under construction, having bigger pipe work, stronger decking in order that the ships can basically, at a moment's notice, reschedule and, and retrofit uh, an ammonia uh, fueled ship uh, engine to those ships uh, going forward. If that were to be the case, we will reduce our emissions from a CO2 perspective by 93%. That's hugely attractive from a commercial perspective, hugely attractive from an environmental perspective, and hugely attractive in terms of changing the dynamic of our industry. So this is not investing just to be, because uh, it's the right thing to do, it's the right thing to do for our business, it's the right thing to do for the environment, and it's the right thing to do for all of our stakeholders. And then it's a bit hard to take this in, but this is the opportunity set that shipping has got. It's made some decent progress in terms of its gain to reduce those emissions um, uh, from the 20 to 2008 CO2 sort of baseline. In order to get to that target um, towards 2030, uh, we have a lot of work to do. But that's the emission profile that we have. On the right-hand side, a complicated chart with the XE regulations I spoke about earlier, and they're backed up by something called the Poseidon Principles, is what the world's shipping banks are basically holding all of the lending to shipping to account from. We've got to reduce our emissions between 1% and 2% every single year to 24, 25. And then beyond that, we've got to raise our game again and reduce the emissions by uh, 3 and 4%. So this is not some longer dated aim that shipping is under, under the microscope from under our global regulator that we hope to achieve. We've got to achieve it next year, the year after, and the year after, and the year after that. So we have a profile in place that means that shipping should be reducing its CO2 emissions by 40% in terms of their intensity by 2030. There's not many industries around that have got that commitment on such a short-term basis. If we can achieve that, then we have the opportunity to set, reset the button and then go for net zero uh, at a later date. But shipping is looking to prove itself and has got the opportunity set uh, in order to do that. We understand that crude is clearly going to come under pressure. Um, uh, and there's a lot of talk around about peak oil or peak supply of oil or peak demand of oil. Um, but crude is still going to be an essential part. If you take crude out of the complete equation, then you're going to make the transition a lot more expensive than it need be and also make the disruption of that transition far more um, disruptive than it needs to be as well. So crude is going to be an important part of that. And then Euronav tends to be an important part of the crude transportation part of that equation. With that, I'll try and draw breath. Um, see if there's any questions. I apologise for the false start I had um, I'm based over here in, in England, um, but I look forward to answering your questions. Yes, uh, thank you, Brian. Very interesting. Um, ik stel voor dat we meteen overgaan naar de vragen. We hebben al heel wat vragen ontvangen uh, van de kijkers, waarvoor dank. Um, Hugo, misschien de eerste vraag uh, meteen aansluitend op uh, waar Brian mee is afgesloten. Um, er is één kijker die zich afvraagt um, wat de rol is van Euronaf nadat olie in een wereld waar olie meer, veel minder nodig is. En hoe jullie kijken naar die, naar die transitie? Misschien andere producten vervoegen? Geeft hij aan als voorbeeld bijvoorbeeld? Hoe, hoe kijk jij daar uh, naartoe? Dankjewel, Olivier. Goedenavond, uh, iedereen. Um, wel, uh, we zitten momenteel in een wereld uh, dat consumeren ongeveer 100 miljoen watt. Uh, uh, olie per dag. Uh, en dus we denken niet dat uh, uh, morgen, overmorgen of volgende jaar, uh, zelfs in, uh, uh, in de volgende decade, zullen we olie niet meer uh, verbruiken. Um, als we kijken naar die, uh, die analisten en, uh, en de projectie uh, qua olieconsumptie, uh, zien we dat we zullen nog stijgen tot en met. 25, 26, dus uh, een andere uh, 4, 5, 6 jaren, afhankelijk van de studies. 
Uh, en dan zullen we uh, weer komen in, in, in een dalende periode. Maar dat zal een zeer trage dalende periode zijn. Um, olie is, is momenteel een zeer uh, belangrijke bron van de energie. Uh, en ik denk niet dat, uh, dat uh, andere bronnen van energie kunnen dat plaatsen uh, overnacht of onmiddellijk. Dus uh, bij Euronav uh, proberen we om uh, dat dienst te leveren. De uh, uh, beste manier. Uh, wat is dat? Dus we gebruiken moderne schepen. Uh, de consumptie van de, de, de moderne schepen is, is heel laag. Als je vergelijken de, de schepen dat we hebben in onze vloot met de schepen dat we hadden in onze vloot uh, misschien 15, uh, 20 jaar geleden. Uh, uh, die, 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 dezelfde schepen met dezelfde capaciteit, een VLCC, die kan, uh, die kan 2 miljoen watt vervoeren. Uh, zal uh, de nijl te consumeren. Dus 100 ton per dag, 15 jaar geleden, en vandaag 45 ton uh, per dag, dus, dus minder dan een nijl. En, en we denken dat we nu nog uh, uh, de consumptie nog uh, een beetje verlagen. Uh, dus nu is zeker niet het moment om uh, uh, te denken aan diversificatie. Uh, wij, wij willen de, de beste, uh, misschien de grootste, uh, zijn uh, op uh, de markt van uh, ja, het vervoer van uh, ruwe olie. Oké, okay, dank je, dat is duidelijk. Um, lieve, ik heb misschien uh, een vraagje voor u. Um, er zijn meerdere kijkers die zich afvragen um, waarom Euronaf uh, de aandelen, de ongeveer 10% aandelen die op jullie boeken staan, um, waarom deze niet vernietigd worden? Of is dat de bedoeling om die op termijn te vernietigen? Um, dus inderdaad, er is een, uh, vorig jaar heeft er, hebben we een uh, inkoopprogramma uh, eigen aandelen gedaan. En eigenlijk de doelstelling van die aandelen dat is nog niet, uh, nog niet bekend. Hé. Inderdaad, daar zijn twee mogelijkheden rond. Ofwel inderdaad, worden die aandelen vernietigd, ofwel kunnen we die aandelen gebruiken in een transactie. Hé. Dus de doelstelling van die aandelen moet nog bepaald worden. Hé. Maar dat zijn eigenlijk de twee mogelijkheden dat we hebben om met die aandelen in de toekomst iets te gaan creëren, afhankelijk van de waarde voor de aandeelhouders. We willen eigenlijk met die aandelen een mooie meerwaarde creëren voor de aandeelhouders. En dat zal dus afhangen van de scenario's die zich voordoen. En op dat moment gaan we kunnen aantonen aan de aandeelhouder ook waar we de meeste waarde uithalen. Oké, okay, dank okay, je. Bedankt. Um, zeer helder. Um, dan heb ik hier uh, nog een vraagje. Um, er is een grote investeerder die um, ja, ongeveer 9% in aandelen van Euronaf verkocht heeft recent. Um, de grootste aandeelhouder van, uh, van een van jullie concurrenten, zeg maar, of collega's. Um, hoe kijkt u er naar, Hugo? Um, er waren wel speculaties over eventuele overname of niet uh, van een van twee partijen. Um, heeft u daar iets aan, aan, aan toe te voegen of wat denkt u daar, daarover? Ja, we, we hebben al een uh, commentaar gegeven. Uh, dus zijn, zijn naam is uh, John Fredrickson. Uh, John Fredrickson is een heel bekend persoon uh, in onze sector. Uh, zeker een vaste uh, leider, een charismatische uh, leider. Um, en hij heeft uh, ongeveer iets minder dan uh, 40% van Frontline. Frontline is een van onze concurrenten. Uh, ook bezig uh, met VLCC's en Suezlands. Um, nu, uh, hij heeft gebruikt zijn, uh, zijn family holding, dus seed tankers, of een deel van seed tankers, om uh, dat investering te doen. Uh, en uh, wij weten dat de reden is dat hij is zeer bullish <laughs> op de sector uh, en hij kan niet meer uh, aan delen van frontline kiezen. Maar vanaf het moment dat hij zit boven de 30%, als ik ook nog één aandeel moet in een pot doen op de rest van de firma. En dat is zeker niet de bedoeling. Uh, dus uh, we nemen als een uh, zeer uh, sterke, positief bericht. De, de eerste is, hij is bullish op de sector en hij is, uh, is zeer bekend om, uh, zijn, op zijn timing. En de tweede, hij heeft uh, euro naar gekozen om uh, verder te investeren in tankers. Dus twee zeer positieve nieuws. Oké, okay. <coughs> bedankt. Um, 
Ik heb hier uh, nog een vraagje gezien. Uh, dat is een lijst. Uh, met een eventjes, uh, ik weet. Het is meer een, 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 een vraag over de risico's die, die u ervan overloopt. Het is een, een, een kijker die zich afvraagt of jullie uh, exposed zijn naar oil spills bijvoorbeeld. En hoe jullie daar uh, rekening mee houden om daar, uh, dat risico in te perken eigenlijk. Ja, uh, Brian in zijn presentatie heeft uh, duidelijk gezegd dat uh, deze job uh, is niet gemakkelijk is. Dus, uh, om uh, met, uh, met risico's en een van de grootste risico's om on ongeval te hebben uh, en daar de risico's om een uh, oil spill. Uh, nu, de sector uh, heeft de laatste oil spill uh, op een tanker was in 2007. Dus uh, de, de reglementatie rond de sector uh, is uh, uh, volledig veranderen. Uh, en, en ja, in het verleden, 10, 15 jaar geleden, was het uh, spijtig genoeg uh, veel meer het geval dat, dat uh, was de Erika, dat was de prestige, dat was de, de heavy spirit. Uh, maar intussen tijd hebben we dubbel wandige schepen. Uh, ja. dus de, de volledig vloot van TLCC, van Suusmax, van Aframax, is nu uh, dubbel wandig. Uh, en dat is veel veiliger uh, dan in het verleden. In, in het geval dat we al een ongeval hebben, uh, normaal gezien is de, de, de eerste, de, de outer wandige, die zal een, de, een impact krijgen. Maar de inner uh, wandige, de, 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 de wandige die binnen zit en, en waar de cargo zit, uh, normaal gezien moet, uh, uh, moet de, de, de shock absorberen. En dus uh, sinds 2007 hebben we geen uh, oil spill uh, gehad in onze sector. Dus af en toe, je kijkt op tv, en je ziet dat er is een, inderdaad een oil spill. Maar daar, en dat was het geval, ik denk dat een jaar geleden in, in Mauritius, dat was een droge bolschip, dat was geen tanker. En die oil spill was de fuel dat de, de, dat schip had. En dat is alleen om voor de motoren. Dus dat is geen cargo. Dat is wel de fuel dat je. Dus in onze sector is het Dutch Wood. Uh, niet meer een, een groot risico, uh, ondanks die, uh, de technologie van de dubbel Oké, okay, super. Um, ik heb dan nog een, een vraagje. Um, ik zal hem misschien in het Engels stellen, misschien dat Brian ook kan antwoorden. Eventueel. Um, that the signs that you highlighted during the presentation were already present um, quite some, are already present a couple of weeks or, or even months. But we didn't see that translate into higher uh, freight rates up until now. Can you uh, give a reason for that, maybe why that why that is, or or, or and what that you see changing in the short term that that rates should pick up eventually because everyone is waiting in the sector, it seems. But um, the rates are not picking up until now. So maybe I can start and, and Brian can uh, mm -hmm. uh, complete my answer. Um, I I. Respectfully disagree. So uh, over the summer we were trading VLCCs uh, at five, six, seven thousand dollars per day, which is extremely low. Uh, it's lower than the OPEX. The OPEX is uh, it's about seven and a half thousand. If you add insurance, etc., you come quickly to ten thousand. So it's certainly the, uh, below the operational expense that, uh, uh, and that um, is is quite low compared to the last 20 years. Normally, the, the sector doesn't go below Pexo because you could see uh, the depth of the crisis over the summer. Now, today, uh, we are well above 15,000. So we are well above OPEX. Um, we are certain companies, including Euronav, well above cash break-even. Uh, and indeed, uh, the P&L break-even are 28,000 uh, for our feet, and you can say, 30,000 on average for the sector, and we are not there yet. Um, so I, I think that the, there is a chance that we get there uh, maybe for, for a few weeks in, in the very middle of the winter, because we expect that uh, there will be more cargo available, same number of ships. So obviously the equilibrium between uh, supply and demand will sh should play uh, in, uh, in favor of the market. Um, but so I respectfully disagree that we were there a few weeks and we haven't seen any improvement. I think when we compare the summer to this winter, we have already seen a major improvement. And then our thesis is that it's the next, it's not next year, but especially next winter, which should be uh, 
very, very strong. And why should it be very strong? Because the order book is very thin, so not too many ships are going to come. And then the older part of the fleet, especially if we continue in those low rates, those ships will gradually go and be recycled and be eliminated and therefore the supply, the number of ships that uh, can transport uh, the cargoes will be reduced. And so we, we are here presenting um, a picture maybe of tomorrow, even though we have already seen um, the improvement that we were expecting, that we were presenting, uh, maybe in our Q2, Q2 uh, analysis, uh, where we had the improvement. Let's not forget something, and I'm sure that most of you know that um, when you are an investor, in capital markets always take a forward look. So, if we were at 35,000, it would probably be too late to enter into the, into the stock of the company because the market would have anticipated that. And, and in fact, that's you see the early signs of this into the stock price because over the summer we were also the six and seven euro and today we are uh, uh, closing on nine so normally people and certainly the institutional investors they position themselves ahead of an improvement in the market because they know that when the improvement is coming then it's probably too late uh, to uh, to take position in the stock so uh, markets have a different timing than uh, our, our freight markets but but here we believe that it's quite visible what's going to happen Okay, perfect. Thank you. Um, the, one other question that we get is, um, misschien, misschien had ik de hoofdzaak van het naar het Nederlands, um, dat de sector is heel gefragmenteerd en versplinterd, zoals we gezien hebben in de, in de slides dat Brian uh, gepresenteerd heeft. Waarom is er dan niet meer neiging om fusies en overnames te doen, om dan eventueel schaalvoordeel te kunnen realiseren? Um, <laughs> dat is de vraag van waarom gebeurt dat dan zo weinig, desondanks de fragmentatie in de sector? Ja, ik heb dezelfde vraag, eerlijk <laughs> gezegd. Uh, ik kan niemand forceren om, uh, om een schip uh, te verkopen. Uh, ik denk dat we hebben uh, uh, handicap gehad bij Euronav in de laatste twee jaar, hè, omdat uh, die uh, uh, aandelen uh, hadden niet de performance dat, uh, dat we willen. Uh, en dus we hadden een discount uh, van NAV, dus NAV, de net asset value. En we hebben getreden aan de discount. Dus we zijn zeer gedisciplineerde mensen. We hebben veel opportuniteiten gezien, maar wij, 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 wij konden niet, niks doen. Maar dat was dan rechtstreeks een dilutie voor onze aandelen. Nu is het terug naar bijna een AB. Ik denk dat we hebben nog een kleine discount van 5%. En we hopen dat we zullen die, de discount volledig, dat gap volledig sluiten. Uh, en hopelijk een uh, premie. Vanaf dat moment zullen we zeker en vast uh, nog een consolidate rol uh, spelen. Maar, uh, maar, maar momenteel, wat, in de laatste 18 maanden, was het heel moeilijk. Uh, dus we zien wat, wat, wat uh, we doen. Um, voor de rest, dat uh, andere bedrijven kunnen ook uh, een consolidate uh, rol spelen. Um, ja, het is. Uh, het is moeilijk, maar we denken dat uh, met die uitdaging dat we zien, hè, de decarbonisation, de, de verandering van fuel, uh, meer en meer uh, reglementatie, zullen, dat, dat zal normaal gezien een, een reter uh, zijn om, uh, om de sector te consolideren. Dus we hopen en we denken dat in de volgende jaren zullen we meer consolidatie zien in de sector. Oké, okay, super. Um, misschien nog een uh, laatste vraagje. Ik zie dat het binnen zeven uur is. Um, er is één investeerder, en het is een korte vraag, ik weet niet of het antwoord even kort zal zijn, of uh, Frederiksen eventueel ambitie heeft om een plaatsje in de boord te krijgen bij Euronaf. En dat heeft zo'n optie zo zijn. Ik uh, heb dat nog niet uh, uh, gevraagd. Uh, we hebben in het, uh, in het verleden aan die laders met meer dan uh, 10% gehad. Uh, Kobel Fred uh, was uh, twee jaar geleden met, uh, ik denk dat het uh, op top was 12%. We hebben nooit een, uh, een zetel gevraagd. Je moet, nooit, uh, uh, je moet, moet altijd herinneren dat vanaf het moment dat je vraagt voor een zetel, uh, dan heb je een beetje geblokkeerd op, op je investering. Hè. Het is niet uh, gemakkelijk om uh, te kopen of te verkopen. 
aandelen wanneer je zit uh, op uh, raam van bestuur. Dus uh, als ik heb vroeger uh, uh, gezegd, uh, momenteel is een investering, en ik denk dat de, de, de vrijheid uh, is dat uh, blijven investering, uh, en ik dan niet uh, in de raam van bestuur komen. Maar ik weet het niet. Ik kan morgen uh, iets vragen en dan de, de, onze raad van bestuur, een supervisor gewoon, een raad van toezicht, uh, zal een beslissing nemen. Oké, okay, zeer helder, dank je wel. Um, dat was onze laatste vraag, dus uh, dat brengt bij, uh, ons bij het einde van deze webinar. Er uh, rest mij niets anders meer dan uh, jullie te bedanken, Hugo, Lieve en Brian, voor jullie uh, aanwezigheid vanavond. Um, en ook de kijkers natuurlijk om massaal in te bellen deze avond. Um, dus voilà, ik wens jullie nog een heel prettige avond en uh, tot ziens. Dankjewel, Dank Olivier. Dank je iedereen. Polyrop.be. Beleg online met inzicht.